Hello and welcome to a quick video on bound charges, bound currents and their roles in Maxwell's equations. Let us begin by gaining an intuitive understanding of Gauss's law. Mathematically, it says that the divergence of the E-field is equal to the free charge density plus the bound charge density. In plain English, it means that how much the E-field is streaming away from a given location depends on the amount of free charge and bound charge at that location. So if you see some location in the universe where the E-field lines seem to be pointing away from some region right here, you know that you must have a very high charge density at that specific point. Furthermore, if we consider the integral formulation of the same law, it's saying that how much the E-field lines are streaming out of some given enclosed region must depend on the total amount of charge inside both free and bound. For example, if we consider this bubble right here, and notice that we have as many E-field lines streaming into the bubble as we have streaming out, we know that the total charge inside must add up to zero. This doesn't mean there's no charges inside, it just means that if there are any charges, then they must in total add up to zero. For example, we could have one very large positive charge here and then two smaller uh, negative charges here, but if you have as many E-field lines going in as going out, the total in here must, must be zero. Okay, that sort of explains the left-hand side of Gauss's law, but what about the individual definitions of free charge and bound charge? What's actually the difference here? Well, it turns out that a free charge is just one where if we apply an E-field to it, it can sort of move arbitrarily far away from its starting point. Whereas if we apply that same E-field to a bound charge, it can only move so far before it comes to a complete rest. I know this may seem like a very obvious uh, point to make, but it's kind of handy to keep in mind for when we talk about bound currents. In fact, there was something that always confused me a little bit about bound currents. I found the word kind of contra contradictory because a current sort of implies that we have something that's in motion, but the word bound implies it's not in motion. So we have something that's moving, but not moving. Like, how does that actually make any sense? So here's how to think about it. If we um, consider a neutral atom with a positive core and a negative electron cloud surrounding it, and then imagine some kind of magical force that pulls them apart, uh, don't worry so much about where this force is coming from, let's just assume that it somehow exists, so that we get a positively charged region on top and a negatively charged region on the bottom, then, um, assuming they're separate with a distance d, we basically have a dipole, and we can define the charge density on top to simply be the amount of positive charge in this region divided by its volume, and same thing for the uh, bottom part right here. Okay, but as you may have seen from another video that I posted last week, you uh, can also define something called a polarization vector, which points from the negative region towards the positive one, and which has a magnitude of the positive charge density multiplied by the separation distance we got before. Now we can ask the question, what happens if P increases over time? Well, that must mean that either the uh, charge density or the distance must be increasing, for example. Well, if we have an increase in the amount of charge or the separation here, then we must have something that looks a bit like a current. Because you can see that if we play this quick animation here again, as we move charges upwards, these positive charges, we're shifting charges around, moving in space, so we must have a, a current, basically. And notice that it only arises when the polarization is changing. As soon as it sort of gets large and reaches a saturation point, we have no more motion and charges, and therefore no more current. So why do we care about this little uh, contribution here to the current term? Well, the reason is that if we consider Ampere's law, we um, can see that the curl of the magnetic field depends on both the change in E-field over time, but also on the charge density, or rather, sorry, the current densities. And if we split that up into two components, the free component and the bound component, where the free current, of course, is defined as just the motion of free charges through a given region per second, and the bound current density, we can see they both play an important role, namely the fact that the bound current is just equal to the change in the polarization over time, as we saw in the, the previous slide right here. Okay, so to just highlight why there's a difference between these two things. Let's consider the following thought experiment here. Let's um, place two metal plates with the water between them and keep them at zero volts initially. We're going to notice that every single water molecule, of course, is sort of polar in nature with a positive part down here and a negative part up here. And we also have a number of ions inside of the, uh, the water here because since the temperature is non-zero, there's a non-zero probability that each of these water mo molecules will break apart into its constituent H plus and OH ions. So now, Let's imagine that we place a voltage across these two plates in such a way that we keep this potential here at zero, but we increase the potential over here to a positive value, which increases over time. So we're sort of ramping up the potential as we as we go. That must mean that we create an E-field that is also increasing over time. And as soon as the E-field gets applied, all of the uh, polarized water molecules will align with that field with all the positive areas pointing towards the left and the negative ones pointing towards the right. Now, first of all, let's consider what happens with the ions that are dissolved inside of this uh, liquid here. As they sense the electric field, all the positive ions will shift towards the left, and all the negative ions will shift towards the right. So in total, we get a current that shifts in the leftward direction, and then back to that current is going to be the conductivity of the water multiplied by the E-field. 
Okay, but what about the bound currents then? Essentially, since the current is or the uh, E field is increasing over time, then um, we shift more and more charge from one region of each water molecule towards the other one. So we sort of stretch out these um, charge clouds even more and more. And in total, we move charge towards the left, or at least we move positive charge towards the left and move negative charge towards the right. So I just want to highlight this distinction here that for the case of the free current, we're actually physically shifting ions through the water, it's like actually moving from one plate towards the other one. But for the case of the bound currents, each individual charge inside of each individual water molecule isn't actually going anywhere. It's not really escaping that water molecule. It's just shifting around internally. But if you add up the contributions of all of these different water molecules, it's as if we have another current that sort of shifts towards the left. So we get a contribution both from the moving ions, but also from the rearrangement of the uh, charges inside of each water molecule. Okay, but again, why do we care about this? So if you solve Maxwell's equations in a dielectric, for example, which could be glass, um, in that case, we have no uh, free charges that are present, but we do have this bound current uh, term that's present. So if we look at Ampere's law again, and we split it up into the free contribution and the bound contribution, then we can see that if we're in glass, we typically don't have any free charges, so we can cancel out this term. And then we get the following expression here. Then if we take another one of Maxwell's equations and apply the curl operator on both sides, and then swap in the uh, expression for the curl of B, we get the following equation here which actually is one of the most important ones to solve when you want to model Maxwell's equations in class, which hopefully I'm going to do in an upcoming video. So I hope you find this little explanation of bound currents and bound charges interesting. Feel free to check out some of my other videos over here and stay tuned for more. Bye-bye.